the, the founders explicitly argue that humans are created in the Mago Dei, the image of God, and therefore should be treated with dignity and respect, and therefore life should be protected, right? James Wilson, the early Supreme Court Justice, is crystal clear that from its conception until the natural end, life must be respected. And so when you have a government that is threatening innocent human life, this is a very serious problem. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us on the program. As always, we appreciate any time you're able to give us. But if you do like the program, be sure to like and subscribe. That helps us fight off the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. And if you want to get me in an Independence Day present, that would be the best one that you could do. And speaking of our Independence Day theme, since that is, of course, coming up this weekend, we have a very special guest that is here who is an expert on the founding. Uh, his name is Dr. Mark Call. He is with George Fox University, a professor of political science there, and has written the book, Did America Have? A Christian founding. He's actually been on the program once before, so let's welcome him back now. Dr. Hall, how are you? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excellent. And always a pleasure to be able to, to have you on the program. Uh, we, we've only had you on once before, but I think this is the first time you've Zoomed in, so it's good to actually be able to, to see your face. Um, one thing that I did want to ask you, too, uh, about did America have a Christian founding, since you're the guy that literally wrote the book on this, one of the things that we've been focusing on in this particular Independence Day is always try to do something different for each Independence Day, even though it's along the same kind of theme. Uh, we've been really looking into and diving into the Christian heritage of our founders today and how their Christian beliefs, even though they were varied and they belonged to different denominations, there was a, a common running theme there going back to their belief in God and their belief that he would set things right is actually what allowed the founding to take place. So if you could offer a little commentary on that for us. Sure. Well, let's begin with the 40,000 foot view. So virtually every American of European descent was a Christian. About 98% were Protestants, 2% uh, were Roman Catholic. There may be 2,000 Jews in four or five cities. So everyone would have identified as a Protestant. Mm -hmm. As you said, there, was, there, there were different denominations, but overwhelmingly Reformed or Calvinist. About 75% were Congregationalists and Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists about 15% Anglicans or so. And as Protestants, they took the Bible seriously. They were people of the book. They routinely quoted the Bible, oftentimes without citation. They made biblical arguments. And they certainly were thinking in biblical terms when they um, decided to, many of them decided to resist Great Britain's, what they considered to be tyrannical acts. Yeah, and one thing that you mentioned there that I think is is always used as a point against the idea that we had a Christian founding, but I think is actually a point in its, its favor, is that it was very often that the founders would quote the Bible without citing it. And so these are often dismissed as, well, those aren't really cite Like if they really wanted to quote the Bible or invoke some kind of religious uh, theme in whatever it was they were dr addressing there, they would have given you book, chapter, and verse, or they would have directly said, you know, from the book of... But here's the thing. I think we do that a lot now in our present society because the level of biblical literacy is very low. Back then, as you pointed out, in the United States, it would have been very, very high. And so it would be kind of like quoting Avengers Endgame. Like, it's something that almost everybody knows. There's really no need to cite it. If you're doing something that's a direct quote, people will automatically recognize it without you having to cite it. And I actually think that that, if anything, strengthens the case that not just the founders, but the people they were conversing with were extremely biblically literate. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. There was simply no need to include citations. And so some modern scholars get misled by this. So a very prominent um, student of the American founding basically said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, there is no evidence that George Washington ever read the Bible or quoted it. And yet he quoted Micah 4.4 more than 40 times. The problem is, as you suggested, he um, simply paraphrased it without having the citation. And so this very prominent student at the American founding, who is biblically illiterate, simply missed out on it. Ben Franklin had a great letter to um, someone in England. He was republishing his work in the in, in, in England. And he basically said, in America, we don't need to include the biblical citations because everyone knows the Bible. However, in England, not so much biblically literate. And so therefore, I'm going to include the biblical citations in um, the, the English version of this text. Right. And I, I think that that does show uh, not only their desire to know it, but also their reverence for 
the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So let's get a little bit more specific since we are here on the 245th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Now, this is a very short document, and yet it has four direct mentions to God. But some people will write that off because they'll, they'll say it doesn't, you know, other than the reference to nature's God, it just kind of indirectly addresses it. But I think that even in the parts of it that don't directly mention God, as it were, it's kind of like the book of Esther, which never actually mentions, mentions God at all, but very strongly implies his providence is in play. And so could you talk to us a little bit about the influence of the, the Christianity of the founders on the Declaration of Independence? Sure. And I think sometimes people get a little misled here because everyone knows that Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence. And Thomas Jefferson is that rare American founder who is not an Orthodox Christian. We know from his private correspondence that he believed in God, but that he rejected miracles, the atonement, the virgin birth, and this sort of thing. And yet this fundamentally misunderstands the nature of a document like the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson did write the first draft, but there was a committee of five that revised this draft, including Roger Sherman, the old Puritan from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. This document then went to the full Congress that revised it again and added to it, including some of these references to God. And so ultimately, when we're interpreting a document like this, I think we have to view it as a product of a community, not something that jumped out of um, Thomas Jefferson's head. So when we read a sentence like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a profoundly theological proposition, and it really grounds the theoretical argument of the whole document. And so when we think about a claim like that, we have to interpret it in light of the 55 so or so men in the Continental Congress at the time. And to these men, almost to a person, this is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a God that absolutely intervenes in human affairs. This isn't some sort of deistic God that Jefferson may have embraced. It was a God of, of, again, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a God that absolutely is involved in human affairs. Well, and that's the thing, too. You don't write the line with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence if you believe that God doesn't do providence, if he's not involved in humans' lives, which is the, the claim of people that, that say that most of the founders were deists. And, and by the way, um, just wanted to, to grant a little nuance to one of the things that you were talking about. Uh, it is true that Jefferson had some questions about the miraculous, but he also asserts the miraculous in some of his other writings. And so uh, one thing that I think a lot of people make a mistake on is when they quote one of the Jefferson Bibles, a lot of people don't realize there's two of them. Uh, mm -hmm. When they quote one of the Jefferson Bibles, they say, well, that Bible excluded all the miracles. Well, it also excluded all of the narratives in general because it was specifically a commentary on Christ's teachings. And so um, it, it's true that Jefferson is one of the least Christian founders, and he was not somebody that was as orthodox as, as maybe the rest of the founders, but to assert that he was some kind of, of deist that only just kind of believed in God or didn't believe in his providence or didn't believe in his direct intervention in the affairs of men, I think is an incorrect characterization that a lot of people fall into. You know, I think it's an excellent point. So just for your listeners, deism often is defined as a, um, a as a, as a belief system that allows the existence of God. Mm -hmm. God creates a world and then re removes himself from it, doesn't intervene in human affairs, doesn't do miracles. If that's in fact what we mean by deism, it's maybe only the case that maybe Ethan Allen is a deist and right. Thomas Paine, although he's English, because you have people like Jefferson routinely invoking God's providence. Now, in a few of these instances, one might say, well, perhaps he did it merely as political rhetoric. But again, it's one needs to make that argument. And oftentimes, people who claim that most of America's founders are deists don't bother to make that argument. You turn to someone like George Washington, who is always included in this list of deists. Mm -hmm. He refers to providence like more than 500 times. And he's very specific. God protected me from this evil. God gave us victory in this battle. And now, if um, you're Washington, you, know you had before. good reason to believe that, considering there was one battle where he had, what, seven bullet holes in his coat, two hats shot off of him, and two horses shot out from under him. So, yeah, I, I, right. think, I think that made Washington a believer, if anything else. <laughs> Absolutely. But one point that you were making there that, that I think is uh, really crucial to understand about the American founding to, to really 
get a grasp on it is the influences of these guys were strongly biblical and also strongly Lockean. I mean, there was a, a very strong influence there from the Enlightenment period. But even that is derivative because Locke is deriving a lot of his political philosophy. If you've read uh, uh, Second Treaties of Government, he's deriving a lot of that from biblical morality. And so uh, regardless of the source material that they were using to sort of develop their ideas, and that's not to say they didn't have original ideas of their own as well, but ultimately uh, they were sort of baptized and bathed in these ideas that have their roots in Judeo-Christian principles. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. So in the Reformed or the Calvinist tradition, almost every idea we associate with John Locke, the right to resist tyrannical authority, the idea that individuals have rights, the idea that government is based on the consent of the governed, that was all there. It was there 100 years before Locke wrote the Second Treatise. And so he's best understood as writing in this tradition. And in his heart of hearts, he was probably something like a Unitarian, uh, but his political teachings are, are, are Christian political teachings, Protestant political teachings. Um, the Roman Catholics weren't quite there yet, but they would eventually catch up with the Protestants in the 20th century and embrace these political ideas. Well, and I think that that's an important way to, to couch sort of what we're talking about is there was some debate as to whether it was, you know, Calvinist or Reformed, but there was no question of, okay, is atheism involved in there? Because there's really not any evidence of that. Uh, the idea that there's something deeply secular or sort of this anti-religious um, sentiment that is undergirding the, uh, the revolution is, is just simply not there. Uh, but with that in mind, and, and this is something that you and I were actually talking about a little bit off air before we uh, got onto the interview, uh, one thing that a lot of Christians seem to disagree on, and there's a, a lot of, you know, very respectable Christian scholars that I think are uh, right hearted, but, but come to the incorrect conclusion. And uh, I wanted to compare notes with you on this because you and I seem to be on the same page. I want to see if we got there through the same rationale. Uh, was the revolution something that is biblical where the, the founders, were they actually following scripture by engaging in the revolution and revolting against Britain, or were they committing a sin and it just happened to yield good results? No, it's a great question. Many Christian scholars who've written on this question have claimed that the war for American independence was unbiblical and unjust. Let's address a biblical claim first. If you read Romans 13, 1 and 2, mm -hmm. it sure seems to say that all government is ordained by God and that Christians have an obligation to obey government. And the church for about 1,200 years pretty much accepted this to be the case. That is, um, you don't get to rebel against the government. If the government tells you to bow down and worship Baal, you refuse to do it, but then take the consequences like Daniel did, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right. did. However, the, there, there were some Catholic thinkers that were toying around with this doctrine of tyrannicide, that is, a just killing of a tyrant, but it's really the reformers, John Calvin and Pone and the author of Windicates Contra Tyrannos, who came up with this, uh, this interpretation in Romans 13. They kept reading. They got down to verses 3 and 4, where it says, governments reward those who do good and they punish those who do evil. And so it's sort of a, a natural question. What if you have a quote unquote government that is routinely punishing those who do good and rewarding those who do evil? We can think most obviously maybe of Hitler's Germany. That is not the sort of quote unquote government that Romans 13 is talking about. So therefore it's permissible for Christians to rise up and overthrow this government. The early reformers insisted that the inferior magistrate should be the ones who lead this battle. But even as John Calvin was writing his institutes where he talks about the inferior magistrates, you have John Knox up in Scotland saying, no, 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 the people themselves, if the inferior magistrates don't resist a tyrannical king, the people themselves may do so. And so this idea is, is just, it permeates America. Remember, America is 98% Protestant, about 75% Calvinist. This was in the air they breathed. There was just no question that if you have a government that is tyrannical, it may be resisted. And this is exactly what the American patriots did. Okay, now I'm going to play devil's advocate with you here because I agree, but I, I want to issue a counter argument to give you a chance to respond. Remember that at the time that Romans was written, it was written to the Roman church, which at the time was facing persecution directly from the Roman government. And it didn't happen at the point that Romans was written, but not long thereafter, you had Roman emperors that were celebrating with public orgies uh, while feeding Christians to lions. I mean, if that's not calling good evil and evil good, uh, 
So why is it that the early Christians did not revolt against Rome at that point, if your analysis is correct? Yeah, this is a great question. This is where I think we have to resort to the, the Christian just war tradition. That is how Christians have historically thought about using force and even lethal force. Um, there's a variety of questions one might ask. One is the most obvious is, is there a just cause? Is resisting a tyrant a just cause? Another question, though, is, is there a reasonable chance of success? So I think the early Christians, there was just no way they could overthrow the Roman Empire. And so therefore, one ought not to use force, one ought, ought not to rebel in this sort of instance. Mm -hmm. In the case of the American colonies, though, I, I think almost by definition, QED, there was a reasonable chance of success because they succeeded, right? They fought the British Empire and, and they won. And so I think we always have to take that into account, right? So to apply it to a contemporary situation, um, one might say that the Chinese government today is treating its Christian and Islamic citizens unjustly. But would these citizens, if they bounded together, have a chance of overthrowing the government of China? Probably not. Therefore, they ought to just keep their heads down and they ought not to revolt against this tyrannical government today. Uh, that, that's a very pragmatic and utilitarian answer. Um, I, I don't know that I, I necessarily disagree with it, but I'm, I'm just saying that like usually in the moral sense, you don't consider the practicality, um, at least in the form of whether or not it's good or evil. You do consider the practicality, of course, of, as to whether you can do it, which you just brought up. And I mean, I, I think that that's wise. God doesn't want us to be suicidal. But at the same time, uh, I, I do think that whether or not something is a moral good or moral evil, practicality rarely if ever plays into that equation. Uh, my rationale for it is a little bit different than yours, and I just kind of want to bounce this off of you and see mm -hmm. what you think about it. Uh, my contention was, okay, we, we do have to submit to government authority. The question is, which one? Because one thing that the people forget about the founding is that there were multiple governments in play, that you had the governments of the states who believed that they should be sovereign that voted in some cases to actually get away from England. And so this is something that was not devoid of government processes. And, and one of the reasons that I contend that the American Revolution worked, where so many others failed or fell apart shortly after they accomplished their revolution and overthrew their uh, oppressors in, in you know, Russia, France, whatever, the reason that America stuck and the others didn't is because we already had governing authorities in place ready to take the reins the second that we were no longer a part of the British Empire. And so I think the fact that there was there were multiple concerns about that and also the fact that the government itself, um, th there was a second government that was saying, uh, no, we're going to not do this and we're going to break away from England. Then the founders have to make a choice of, OK, now we have to pick which governing authority the Bible commands us to be loyal to. Yeah, no, I think that's a very fair point. So, um, you know, the, the, the patriots viewed the British Empire is working like this. You have mm. England, you have Virginia, you have Massachusetts, you have South Carolina, and so forth. There's about 50 British colonies at the time. Each of these is self-governing. So if you're in Virginia, the House of Burgesses passes taxes, you pay your taxes to the government of Virginia, and the government of Virginia uses it for various purposes. All of these entities are held together by the king, right? By a loyalty to the king. The king provides protection in exchange for some sort of uh, obligation. The problem with the, um, really, things started in 1765 when the English Parliament decided to start taxing the American colonists. And the American colonists said, no, you can't do this. This is beyond your authority. It would be similar to the, the government of Parliament, uh, the, gov the Parliament of Canada taxing American citizens today. It simply is not, it, it is not permissible. I think one thing that's telling is Americans didn't just pick up rifles and start shooting right away in 1765, right? right? Yeah. There were boycotts, there were petitions, there were petitions to Parliament, petitions to the King, petitions to the British people. And this went on for well over 10 years before it, it eventually British started sending troops to America, seizing weapons, and Americans finally said, okay, this is enough. And they resisted by, by, by force. And you're exactly right. You have all these, I think Calvin would call them inferior magistrates, right? The government of Virginia, the government of Massachusetts. And then collectively, they came together in the Continental and Confederation Congress um, to act at a national level. Yeah, so absolutely. You have differing, different government authorities. And the American patriots were making, I think, very good arguments that what parliament is attempting to do is unjust. 
it's unconstitutional. The king, um, the, the Declaration of Independence, of course, doesn't mention parliament at all. It only mentions a king. And the problem there was the king had removed the colonists from his protection and was engaged in acts of violence against them. And the Declaration of Independence documents this. And I think shows, I think it proves definitively that there was just cause to resist these tyrannical acts. Well, and that's one thing that's interesting that you kind of hinted at it there, but I've always said about the Declaration, if you want to know the story of the Revolution and the build up to it, all you have to do is read the Declaration, because it tells you right there, uh, the things that you were talking about where they start engaging in acts of violence against them, that's mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, if you want to talk about the taxes that led up to it, that's mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. If you want to talk about the fact that they have over and over and over again tried to get the king's attention, told him what their problems were, and were met with scorn, that's also in the Declaration. And so all of these things are specifically laid out in the Declaration of Independence. And even though I think people generally, if they've, they've studied history even a little bit, they know like the, the first part and the last part. Um, and I think that's good that they know at least that, but they kind of sometimes miss the fact that that middle section where it gets specific in some of the, the problems that they have, uh, first of all, it gives you insight into where their mind was and the rationale for breaking away. And second, and I think that this may be um, even more important, is that it gives you the basis of the Constitution. Like most of our constitutional amendments, you can find the rationale for why they exist in the Declaration. And so um, I think that when you look into that document, they were emphatic about it. They weren't hiding the ball. They weren't just a, a bunch of angry rabble rousers that wanted to, to do what they, you know, whatever they wanted. They, they came to this conclusion through a long, methodical process, and I think that their faith played a very instrumental role in that, and you can see that as evidenced by the fact that they mentioned God several times in the Declaration itself. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree at all. I think that's absolutely right. Um, once, uh, about 15 years ago, I actually read through every Supreme Court decision that mentioned the Declaration of Independence. And it is remarkable how often the U.S. Supreme Court will reach back to the Declaration to help explain what is meant by various rights in the Bill of Rights and, and this sort of thing. So yeah, the Declaration of Independence, one of the four organic laws of the United States, um, I, I, I'm the romantic side of me tends to think of it as a mission statement, right? The Constitution is kind of bland compared to the majestic lines in the in the Declaration, especially the first and second paragraphs. Yeah, so that brings me to uh, another thing that I'm interested in that I think you might have some valuable insight on. Um, when the founders said that they had a, a firm reliance on the protection of divine divine providence, um, what exactly did that look like for them? What were they counting on when it comes to protecting them? Because our, our ideas of divine providence today, especially in the minds of most modern Protestants, I think is is a little bit different than theirs. And so if you could speak to that just for a second. Sure. Well, I, I think almost to a person, again, an exception of maybe an Ethan Allen, a Thomas Young, you can point to one or two, um, probably atheists, certainly deists. Um, they believed that God intervened in human affairs. God was in charge. God brought about his will in this country, in, in, in the world, really, and in this country specifically. And so, yeah, when they picked up arms against Great Britain, they thought that God was, in fact, on their side and that he would bring about victory. Now, of course, as you know, that it, it wasn't just simply a story of victories. The patriots lost some battles and this sort of thing. But ultimately, they were convinced that God would bring about justice. And I think they were right. Well, and, and as I'm sure that you know, 56 of the men that, that signed the declaration, there was a very large percentage of those guys that didn't see the end of the war. Or if they did, that they were they went from being very wealthy men to being beggars. And so uh, there was quite a bit of personal sacrifice involved in the people that decided to sign this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I guess maybe the thing that I kind of want to leave the audience with, so this will be my my last question to you. Um, when it comes to the basic ideals of life, liberty, and property, if you're looking at Thomas Jefferson's original draft, Pursuit of Happiness, if you're looking at the revised one by Adams and, and Benjamin Franklin, you know, uh, when you're looking at that, those primordial rights that are mentioned there seem to be the primary driving force behind their decision that the government is violating these, therefore it is right for us to break away from them. Uh, what do you think is the, uh, you know, the, 
I guess the scriptural bedrock for that. What what scriptures had the most influence on them and drove them to believe that these are the rights that are most important that are being, uh, you know, set upon by the the British Crown, and because of that, we must break away from them. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I like that a lot. So um, the the founders explicitly argue that humans are created in the Mago Dei, the image of God, and therefore should be treated with dignity and respect, and therefore life should be protected, right? James Wilson, the early Supreme Court Justice, is crystal clear that from its conception until the natural end, life must be respected. And so when you have a government that is threatening innocent human life, this is a very serious problem. As well, liberty, the uh, idea that individuals must be free to worship God according to the dictates of conscience and act upon their religious convictions. Um, when the British government was threatening to send a, a bishop to British North America, presumably to crack down upon all these dissenting Protestants, these non-Anglicans, they saw a real existential threat to liberty, a, a proper God-given understanding of liberty. And the founders, incidentally, understood that there's a difference between liberty and licentiousness. This is a, a difference that is lost in us today, right? So the U.S. Supreme Court says, for instance, that we have a right to curse in public. We have a right to uh, burn the American flag as a form of political protest. Uh, it, the American founders would have had no idea about this. They would say, no, that's licentiousness. You don't have a right to do that sort of thing. We have a, a freedom and ability to do what is right. Yeah, so they grounded these rights absolutely on the word of God uh, in, in Christian theology. Um, that, and that's just life or liberty. We could keep going if you wanted, but those are right. probably two of the most important and essential rights. Yeah, just a, a quick little note on that, because I, I agree with you, because just because you have the right to do something doesn't mean that you ought to do it. And, and it also, liberty, in the, in the scriptural sense, always comes coupled with responsibility. There is no exception mm -hmm. that I'm aware of where liberty and responsibility don't come hand in hand when they're granted in the scripture. Uh, but a great example of that is George Washington did not allow his soldiers to drink or cuss in the army. Now think about that. <laughs> Uh, compared to, and, and I love our servicemen today, but they're kind of known for drinking and cussing, and that's not a thing that would have been allowed in George Washington's army. Um, but yeah, so what you're talking about there, and I, I know that I said that that was going to be my last question, but I think I have to ask one more just because it, it made me think of something else. Um, there is so much, and I hate that I even have to address this, but it is the elephant in the room here. Um, there's been so much said, especially recently, about the founders when it came to race relations and how they didn't really mean what they said when they were saying all men are created equal in the Declaration, and that was uh, just flowery language, which uh, I would offer the counter-argument of, well, if uh, slavery was popular in the day as you claim it is, then why would that have been something that it would have been for political expedience if people don't like it? But anyway, uh, getting off that point. Uh, do you think that Jefferson and the Committee of Five and then eventually the 56 signers genuinely believed this idea that you're talking about of man being created in, in God's image and that extended to all men? I think they absolutely did. And they were reasoning to the proper conclusion that therefore slavery is unacceptable. Slavery must be ended. And they took a number of steps to end it, right? So eight states voluntarily ended slavery or put slavery in the road to extinction between 1776 and 1804. We forget about this. Nobody knows this, right? Including, um, you mentioned the Committee of Five, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, never owned a slave. In 1783, he penned the statute in Connecticut that put slavery on the road to extinction. He understood that slavery was an unacceptable practice. The Northwest Ordinance passed by the Confederation Congress banned the, the expansion of slavery into the Northwest Territory. Those territories that became the states of Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin, Minnesota and that sort of thing, Illinois, Indiana. Um, they understood slavery was an evil and it had to be ended. Very unfortunately, in the 1790s, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which made cotton production far more profitable in the American South. And so slavery sort of got a new lease on life in the American South. And eventually, um, Southerners started defending slavery as a positive good. But nobody, literally no one in the American founding defended slavery as a positive good. I think everyone recognized it was an evil that needed to be ended. They were optimistic that it would be ended. And, um, and in, many, in many states, very specific concrete steps were taken to end it. Well, and what you mentioned in the Committee of Five that, are, that drafted the Declaration and, and revised Thomas Jefferson's original draft, 
You also have Ben Franklin, who founded the first abolitionist organization in America. You also have John Adams, who argued vehemently against slavery his entire life. And mm -hmm. you have Thomas Jefferson, who people say, well, he's a slave owner. Well, yes, he is. But he tried to abolish slavery three different times, once in Virginia, once nationally, and once in France. And so you're right that even the people that actually owned slaves and were a part of the system, and in some cases profited from the system, were against it. At the time of the Constitution, when that was put together in 1789, there were only two states that were actually still in favor of slavery, South Carolina and Georgia, and neither one of them defended it as a good. They said, we should get rid of it gradually versus all at once. That was their argument. And so mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely correct in, in pointing some of that out, that the overwhelming evidence is, uh, you know, we, we can say some some very different things about what happened after the 1790s, but at the time of 1776 on July 4th, when they signed this document, they absolutely meant it. And in the original Thomas Jefferson draft, it actually specifically called for an end to slavery as a reason for separating from the British crown. So uh, Dr. Hall, it's been absolutely great to have you as it always is. I, I love your insight. Uh, if somebody's heard what you've said and they, they like what you've said and they want to learn more, uh, I know that they can buy your book. How would they go about doing that? You know, probably Amazon's the best place to get it. Um, did America have a Christian founding? I address a number of these questions. I have a book that will come out probably in a year, Proclaim Liberty Throughout All the Land, where I, I will talk about slavery and then the abolitionist movement, which we didn't even touch on, right? The abolitionist movement of the 19th century, fundamentally driven by Christians, motivated by their faith, to end the evil uh, horror of slavery. Yeah, so we, we, we neglect these sorts of things at our peril, it seems to me, and I know you agree. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hall. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Caleb. Take care. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell. If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see, I identify as a Hispanic woman, so if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade?